Now, it wouldn't be a USISA conference if we, if we didn't hear from HESA. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Annette Van Sill. She is Director of Technology Transformation at HESA, and Annette will provide an update on the Data Futures Programme. Oops. <laughs> Actually, that's a more comfortable height for me, as long as it doesn't go down much further. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the invitation to come along and talk about data futures. Um, it's quite common for HESA folk to be out and about talking about various things that we are doing in the data space. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm the Programme Director for Data Futures. I joined HESA um, about 15 months ago now, so I'm a relative newbie to the education sector and to HESA. Thankfully, we have lots of people who have immense um, depth of knowledge around the data that everyone uses to underpin the higher education sector in general, so I'm surrounded by really good people who understand the data to an extraordinary degree, um, which is a blessing, I can tell you. Um, Uh, just a, a sort of quick run through the agenda. I'm going to just do a quick recap of where we are on data futures um, and talk about what our current focus and next steps are. Um, talk a little bit about how we consult and engage with the sector. There is an awful lot of that going on um, throughout the year. Um, just reflecting back on John's presentation and the benefits um, and the sort of homecoming prize, we'll just touch on what we're still aiming for with data futures having had a few trials and tests and a few monsters along the way in the last year or so. Um, and I also just want to finish off with some key messages uh, that uh, is, is in response to some of the feedback we've had from some of our engagement with the sector, that there are some really, really key messages to reiterate um, and make sure that um, everyone is clear on um, some of the fundamentals around data futures. So you will see um, in the communications we issue and in presentations, we will be repeating some of the messages because um, that seems to be uh, needed to make sure that everyone has a really clear understanding. Um, I'm sure we'll get told to stop when uh, people know and have had enough, but uh, we are reinforcing some of the key messages for now. So, um, what is data futures for the benefit of the uninitiated um, who, who aren't living and breathing it every day? Uh, we are refreshing the UK higher education student data infrastructure. So the, the data collection system that has evolved within HESA over 20, 25 years um, to be extraordinarily detailed in terms of the quality rules and the data that's submitted and how it's all um, quality assured. We are refreshing all of that with data futures. It will support collection, quality assurance and dissemination of data. Um, and it will have a, a brand new student data model, which will combine the old student and AP records. Uh, it was intended to include the ITT record. That is going to come into scope at some stage, but has been removed um, from the first uh, iteration of the data model um, for Go Live. So that will, that will be amalgamated in, in due course at a later stage. So the name of the game is providing timely, assured, in-year data three times a year, um, primarily for statutory customers, but also uh, potentially other data customers who need data earlier than can be provided or more frequently than can be provided with a current annual data collection cycle. It looks quite simple on the slide. There is an awful lot to choreograph and a lot of moving pieces here, not just within HESA, in terms of implementing a new solution and a new data model, the challenge of implementing that across the sector all at the same time, because everyone's data underpins funding and regulation and other decisions, um, and also the challenge of um, weaving in transition timescales that work for the sector and being mindful that they have other things going on apart from data futures, and also their software suppliers for the providers also have to adapt their systems for data futures. So there is a lot to weave together to um, end up with an implementable plan. 
in terms of where we've come from and where we've going, where we're going, uh, we started uh, a lot of detailed design work uh, back in 2017. Last year was all about solution build and the alpha pilot. So we had some really good engagement from our alpha providers in testing. Um, 14 providers, also statutory customers involved in that as well. And then 2019 has been quite a painful year. So, you know, the tests and trials and tribulations of having to make a very necessary go, no go decision earlier in the year. It's quite, quite a painful decision to sort of change direction and delay implementation, but it was absolutely the right decision to make. We are all very conscious of the importance of the quality and credibility of the data that underpins the HE sector. Uh, so we took a very, very thought through, considered decision to change direction um, and move from the original ambition of continuous data collection with fragments of data being knitted together by the solution to discrete collections three times a year instead. Um, so that go, no, go decision was taken earlier this year, and we have been in a, in a redesign phase since. We have been looking at the solution. Uh, there's a lot to rework to move from continuous collection to discrete collection, and also the data model. Um, so there's a lot to rework on that as well. Um, once we are through the glorious days of you know the solution being complete and the slightly mammoth task of developing all the quality rules and derived fields that underpin the assurance element of the system we will be uh, looking at alpha beta and mandatory trial um, it's really important that this lands well in the sector and that the sector get taken on the journey and have the opportunity to engage with both the solution and the quality rules and the guidance around the new data model um, so that they can submit their data um, and be confident in it. So we are still looking at a mandatory trial as part of the transition planning, which would be for all providers. That will be preceded by beta testing and we will consider when we get further into the transition planning um, going beyond the 100 plus beta providers and having a, 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 you know, an element of open beta towards the latter part of that time scale. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for um, sector engagement with, uh, with the solution and the data model and the rules. Um, go live, we are conscious uh, there'll be, you know, it's very difficult to actually get this live um, woven in around the, the existing data collection cycles. So there is likely to be a transition crunch for providers and we are extremely mindful of that in our transition planning and trying to finesse a way through that uh, works for providers as best as it can before we get to the you know the, the the glorious days of improved data and the benefits and the sort of homecoming uh, elements that john was talking about earlier so our current focus is very much on working through that change of direction from continuous to discrete collection, both in terms of the technical solution and the data model. That drives um, some necessary changes to the data model, um, moving from continuous to discrete. And at the same time, we are also taking the time to look at some of the elements of the data model that we had had feedback from providers uh, that they were finding particularly challenging. So we are in the, in the midst of a, a, a quite extensive and really valuable consultation exercise um, on areas such as curriculum, um, FTE and off-venue activity, where we've listened to a lot of feedback from providers and we are working through the, deta the detailed um, nuts and bolts of that with statutory customers and providers to define the right solutions in those areas. Um, Rachel Wilkes is leading on a lot of that, which uh, anyone who is involved in your student uh, data collection will be very familiar with, Rachel. Um, and there is some really um, immensely valuable detailed work going into that to make sure that the data model is as good as it can be. Um, and we are very conscious of the need to take the time to make sure this is as right as it can be, to minimise um, future changes um, throughout the delivery 
lifespan of the program um, before go live. That's not to say we will eliminate changes. We, you know, we have to be able to react to changes in the HE landscape, uh, but we do want to make sure that we've given enough consideration and thought to the data model to, to make sure that it, it's, it is going to work without fundamental change um, going forward. And that's obviously one of the lessons that we learned from uh, some of the experience to date in data futures. Um, alongside all of that, we are also taking the opportunity to sort of reconfirm our requirements and make sure that there is no ambiguity around either the functional and the non-functional requirements. We've also strengthened governance. We have a program board meeting um, much more regularly now. We have more involvement from uh, key people. And we've also increased capacity in terms of um, project and program management and technical capacity as well within HESA. So there has been a, a lot going on to make sure that we can have the right skills, the right capacity um, to drive the program and uh, increase confidence in the plans that we're working through. And we are continuing to engage with the sector, um, never as much as uh, the sector would like. Uh, we are a relatively small organisation, but people are out and about quite frequently um, at various events. So to give you, I'll give you a bit of a flavour of that later on. Um, so where we are in terms of next steps, I am going to manage your expectation. There isn't going to be any breaking news about implementation timescales today. You will appreciate that we have to work that through very cautiously, um, choreograph all the moving parts and communicate um, across the sector all at, all at the same time. So as soon as we are able to communicate on that, we absolutely will. Um, for the time being, our focus is on um, confirming those requirements, making sure that they are signed off as a, as a foundation for where we're going next with the programme. Um, continuing consultation on the specification, there's a few areas that still need to be worked through um, that it will be, it will add a lot of value to the data model once we've worked those through. And some of those will run on into um, January for sort of scheduling uh, reasons. Uh, there will be also a lot of supporting guidance that needs to be produced around the, specific, the specification as well to make sure that providers can engage with it. And again, we are, we are moving from you know, a, a, a model rules and guidance that's evolved over many, many years in a very interactive process as providers have engaged with it over the last couple of decades to something new. So there is an awful lot to do in that space and no doubt the guidance in particular is probably going to be something that needs to evolve as we, um, you know, we, we see how people interact with the guidance, whether it's clear enough or not, whether there are amendments needed uh, because people are interpreting it differently. So there'll be a lot of focus on um, that guidance alongside uh, the quality rules development, which is quite a mammoth task to undertake. We are looking at delivery plans, including the transition options and um, engaging with, uh, you know, we, we've engaged with our provider forum previously on that, uh, and we will continue to uh, engage with people on uh, transition plans as we firm those up and engaging with the sector on all sorts of things in all sorts of ways. So to bring that to life for you, our programme and sponsoring boards have representation from statutory customers and a number of sector bodies uh, and they provide some really useful uh, insight from their positions within the sector on some of the key things that we wrestle with and the key decisions that need to be made. Uh, we have regular statutory customer workshops, so there's quite an iterative process now around uh, aspects of the data model and um, quality expectations. We've had uh, several software supplier workshops where um, all the software suppliers uh, that can attend come to HESA and we talk around uh, the, the current progress, understand their timescales and challenges, um, and we'll be continuing to do that going forward. Um, we also have a, a Teams channel operating with software suppliers as well, so in between those events there's a more interactive opportunity for people to engage and get uh, responses and um, just had feedback today from Carol from Elysian that that's working really well and is quite appreciated. 
We have our provider forum, uh, which meets probably three times a year, I think. Um, and again, quite a lot of representation from different bodies or, that we, we regularly talk about data futures, where it's going, um, key challenges. There's quite a representation at not only conferences, but also sector meetings, um, workshops, HESPA, um, other, other shock data matters, other, other events through the year. There'll, there'll normally be somebody from HESA um, talking about data futures in some capacity. Uh, we also attend software supplier user groups with um, so software suppliers and their providers and HESA at the same time where we can. Obviously, we are spread quite thin in terms of some of this engagement, but that is something that we found quite useful, and we know um, both the providers and the software suppliers really appreciate that. Um, consultation on the specification, readiness surveys, feedback from Alpha, there's been a lot of really um, insightful feedback from the sector at various stages um, in the last year, uh, which has been really, really helpful. Uh, and our communications that, that get issued uh, through JISC mail and website updates. Uh, and of course, we've had extensive engagement with our Alpha group. So um, I would like to say a big thank you to the Alpha group who have contributed greatly to the testing um, in previous phases. And we are looking to come back to you for more input in due course, uh, which will be really, really helpful uh, if we can get you engaging with the new data model and working through some of the interpretation of the guidance that's going to be incredibly useful to any sort of refinement that needs to be done prior to go live uh, so yeah they were really really um, very engaged bunch some very insightful feedback that we've had from various people within our alpha group couldn't be doing this without them and just to focus on what's the prize that we're after you know in in terms of benefits uh, particularly recognising that we have had a change of uh, direction in how we're implementing the three times a year data collection and in delivery timescales as well. So high quality data three times a year is, is the key driver um, from, for, from statutory customers, being able to get that early insight into things like access and participation um, is, is really important, particularly for the OFS um, in terms of English providers. Better utility of data, so better, uh, we should be better able to use some of the data that's collected from the student collection for other purposes. And in due course, hopefully, that will, that will be helpful for providers to be able to have more timely data that they can offer rather than having to collect uh, different data through the year for different data customers. There's been an incredible amount of work um, going to the data model. So, you know, that's had a, a dramatic uh, refresh with an awful lot of eyes on it from um, all different angles. So, you know, that's really going to stand us all in good stead going forward. Um, more timely data to support decision making is obviously key. And data is, you know, key for statutory customers, providers, students in the choices they make. Um, government in terms of policy you know there's an awful lot that underpins so many things within the sector and we also uh, would expect the new system to be more responsive to change easier to change and adapt with a with a lower um, impact within HESA operationally in due course in terms of the time some of that takes as well so they are the benefits that are still very much um, front and center uh, in in what we're looking to achieve And I just wanted to sort of finish this with some, some, some words around the key messages, really. Uh, and this is in response to some of the, some of the feedback we've had from uh, providers and sector agencies through, through various engagements. Um, probably the number one key message is in-year data is coming. It is a key driver for the statutory customer it is not going away um, just because Data Futures was delayed. So there is a real um, sort of reinforcement of that message that in-year data is absolutely one of the fundamental things that Data Futures will be delivering. And it remains really, really key and really important. So anyone who thinks it's all going to go away and 
disappear. Um, I'm, I'm just need to reinforce that data three times a year is absolutely the, the, the key purpose and that's the key thing that, that, that will be delivered. The move to discrete collections does mean that that is going to be three complete submissions each academic year, which we know has implications, obviously, uh, and that would be a full submission of all the relevant fields um, at each stage. So uh, there is more specific guidance on the HESA website around what that means, because as I'm finding out with all things data, you know, there are eight different ways to interpret something, and we do need to make sure that the meaning of these words is really, really clear. We are very aware that um, data such as entry qualifications, which can sort of be tidied up over the course of a year currently, will need to be submitted in the collection where studies commence within reason, with a bit of leeway for sort of how close to the end of the, the, the um, submission period you are. And that, we understand, is going to be quite a challenge. So in terms of what providers can be doing to get ready for data futures, really looking at business processes that may need to change to be able to submit data earlier in the year and also to any, any business process changes around improving the quality of data. Um, each data submission from most providers, I think there's an average of 30 submissions across the whole sector. So there is a lot of iteration involved in the annual data submissions. And if we're looking at that happening three times a year, obviously the more work that can be done within providers in terms of that data being right before it's submitted will obviously pay dividends going forward. So um, some providers have been really engaged in looking at their business processes uh, and how they can make sure that they are going to be slick and you know, support the drive for in-year data. And that's definitely an area uh, that, will, that will be worth looking at. Um, we've been really appreciative of some of the coding manual changes engagement we've had from people. So again, the more the more feedback we get on whether elements are clear or not, or whether you don't think they, they work, or whether you, know, you don't understand what they mean, that helps us to refine it and make sure that it is going to uh, provide the clarity and help with that QA process. So there is more information on some of these concepts on the, on the website in the Data Futures Key Concepts area. Uh, again, I would just reiterate the mandatory trial for all providers. So the first time you submit data, won't be after go live, it will be before go live so that you can exercise your own processes as well as the uh, data collection and so can we at ESA. So it will be um, a, a, a big combined effort across the sector to make sure that go live is successful. And we will of course be providing more information as and when we can, uh, including the all important question of implementation timeframes. We are very conscious of the um, timescales within the sector to be able to react to change and for software suppliers to do the work they need to to be able to support data futures. And we're also very conscious that we need to um, communicate timescales uh, with confidence. So there is some work going on behind the scenes at the moment to make sure that we can uh, develop um, and communicate implementation timeframes in due course with the, with the right level of confidence. That's all I wanted to say today. Uh, I am happy to take questions if there are any. Hi, um, this is a question about finances really. A lot of um, our supplier contracts use HESA data for charging us our um, maintenance. Has it been discussed at all with the Alpha Group about whether there's any um, unintended consequence with the three collections of data or the data model perhaps affecting our FTE? Uh, your FTE uh, numbers. Uh, FTE is an area of the data model that is definitely being discussed in some detail in terms of how that's recorded, uh, but in terms of implications for uh, software supplier charging, if that's the question, I'm not aware of that. So that might be something uh, that we need to take away. 
um, I've got a couple of colleagues in the audience. Matt, could you just make a note of that for me so that we can um, feed that back? Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, Richard Bevington, Loughborough University. Um, currently, we supply data annually, and each year the data fields required could change. So does that mean that, that these fields could change three times a year? I think, similar to today, we would be aiming for most changes to be annual rather than every reference period. That's not to say that we could rule that out completely, but we would obviously be mindful of the impact of changing those fields three times a year. That would be difficult for, for, for us as well as providers. Um, that would be driven by statutory requirements. Um, so if there's a policy change or something that needs to be implemented, uh, but certainly that's... Uh, I don't think the intention is to be making wholesale changes three times a year, because that would be quite a merry-go-round to be on, wouldn't it? Hi, James Smith, Birkbeck College. Um, I seem to recall sitting in a similar room several years ago listening to a presentation about the start of this, and one of the explanations given, or the mitigations given for increasing the burden of collection on the sector was that there was an aim to reduce other collection, the burden on the sector from other collection from other sector bodies. So I wonder if you could say something about how that's going. That is still the intention. I think it's going to be uh, one of those things that's easier to achieve once Data Futures is live. Um, and we've actually got the proof of the pudding, if you like, in terms of the data being collected and available. So it certainly hasn't gone away as an aspiration. I think we will work that more actively once we have um, firm delivery timescales. Hi, uh, you mentioned Microsoft um, using Teams channel for yeah. software suppliers. Yeah. Is that right? Is there, for, for, as an in house instit uh, institution with an in house system, are we able to subscribe onto that? Uh, I believe so, yeah. And um, yeah. certainly when we have our software supplier workshops, we, it, they are open to in house providers as well. Ah. Sorry, I'm just using software suppliers in, in probably lazy shorthand. We, we do mean the in house providers as well in the, in the same breath normally. Okay, thank you.